Saturday morning when uh, easily be sleeping. But thanks to the power of coffee and hopefully the interest in uh, the issue of free speech, uh, it will give you something to think about. Uh, what we thought we'd do is uh, keep it very conversational. I'll give a few minutes of remarks. Uh, my colleague Ryan Hageman will give a few minutes of remarks. And uh, we'll try to touch on a couple of different aspects of the issue of free speech in the digital age. Then open up for questions, comments, thoughts that you might have. Uh, my name is Ajit Pai. I'm one of the uh, five commissioners of the Federal Communications Commission. Although nominated by President Obama in 2011, I was, I'm a Republican. Uh, who was recommended uh, by Senate Republican leadership, and I've had the privilege of being at the FCC for almost four years now. One of my core issues is free speech as it applies to uh, it, the internet and all kinds of other digital platforms. And I think this is a really timely topic. And part of the reason is, is just zooming out, is that the human instinct is not to protect the freedom of speech when you think about it. I mean, humans are tribal beings. We want to be around, uh, and we find security in being around people who think and act as we do. And humans are also communicative beings. We want to talk to others. And so when you combine those two things, it follows that over time, we're going to try to limit ourselves to people who talk like us and think like us. And that's what I think makes our First Amendment so unusual and so critical. You know, despite this human instinct, the founders, and James Madison in particular, who wrote the original draft of the First Amendment, guaranteed constitutional protection uh, to anybody. I mean, they, the founders said, the Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. But remarkable as that guarantee is, on paper, it's not decisive. It doesn't execute itself. It doesn't, uh, by itself, guarantee that you will have the freedom of speech. And in other words, uh, you know, whatever the words on the cold parchment are, they alone are not sufficient to guarantee this freedom. I would argue that it depends heavily, perhaps even exclusively in modern times, on culture. Uh, to give the First Amendment meaning in the physical world, it's critical for every American to say, as that famous, uh, famous aphorism goes, I may disagree with what you have to say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. And that's something that has served us well for a couple of centuries. But I would submit to you that that culture is fraying in America today. Across this country, we see people who are perfectly happy to see uh, those with views that they don't agree with shouted down or excluded altogether from the public square. And nowhere is this uh, more common, as the younger members of this audience would know, uh, than college campuses. It seems like every single week we hear a new story about uh, somebody from the academy with unpopular views uh, being told, You're, <laughs> you have no right to speak here, uh, we'll disrupt your event, or we just want to exclude you altogether. I mean, just a couple of the examples that uh, spring to my mind. You know, the Yale student who screamed at a professor that his job as master of a residential college, a term that itself is now under politically correct attack, uh, is not, quote, it's not about creating an intellectual space. It is not. Do you understand that? It's about creating a home here. I highly urge you to see that video on YouTube if you haven't already. Or take a look at the comments by a Swarthmore student who said a couple of years ago, uh, complaining about a conservative speaker, and I quote, what really bothered me is the whole idea that at a liberal arts college, we need to be hearing a diversity of opinion. Just think about that. I don't think we should be tolerating Robbie George's conservative views because that dominant culture embeds these deep inequalities in our society. Now, keep in mind, these comments were made in the middle of the Obama administration, not exactly the, the apex of uh, conservative dominance. Uh, th consider the president of Williams College, who just last month unilaterally canceled a speech by a conservative uh, who was invited by students, saying, and I quote, I've made it clear to the students who did that, who, who invited the speaker, this college will not provide a platform for him. Many of his expressions clearly constitute hate speech, and we will not promote such speech on this campus or in our community. Or think about the Harvard student, unfortunately my own alma mater, who proposed in the campus newspaper, Quote, no academic question is ever free from political realities. If our university community opposes racism, sexism, and heterosexism, why should we put up with research that counters our goals simply in the name of academic freedom? I would like to propose a more rigorous standard, one of academic justice. When an ac academic community observes research promoting or justifying oppression, it should ensure that this research does not continue. Now, one might be tempted to shrug at these anecdotes or even laugh at them, and after all, what difference do these scattered examples from uh, you know, isolated, uh, highly privileged uh, communities, uh, college communities make? Uh, don't we have more important things to worry about than these little Robespierre's, as the Wall Street Journal memorably put it? 
But I would submit to you that these examples are not petty, but they are prologue. And that is because according to the Pew Research Center, 40% of the millennials, 40%, believe that the government should prevent people from making certain offensive statements. And if this is going to be the new orthodoxy, if younger generations are taught or demand that some views should not be heard and thus ought not be held, then in time, American society is going to mirror uh, the society that, uh, the world that George Orwell depicted in Animal Farm. You know, all opinions are equal, but some opinions are more equal than others. And that is especially dangerous in the digital world. For the internet is arguably the greatest enabler of free speech and free expression this world has ever known. I mean, Gutenberg, Marconi, and others who have transformed the power of words with technological innovation would surely marvel at this technology that we enjoy today that allows anybody, anytime, any place to say something online and immediately reach millions, perhaps even billions of listeners. And this has been a particular benefit to conservatives, as I'm sure you know. Uh, our views that once were marginalized, if they were given exposure at all, now can find a home in cyberspace. And others can read, can hear, can connect with those views in so many ways. I'm certainly going to be dating myself with many members of this crowd, but I'll never forget when the incredible power of this digital platform came home to me. It was early in 1998, and I first came across and started avidly following something strange called the Drudge Report. It wasn't fancy. Uh, the layout was in three very basic columns. The font was, and still is, Courier, perhaps the most boring font you can find. Uh, the colors were nothing more than black and white. And the name itself was sort of esoteric, the Drudge Report. But what all of that website lacked in Flash it really made up, at least to, for me, in terms of significance. I quickly realized that this website was at the vanguard of a digital revolution. That it was, by, by passing the traditional media, by presenting content in the, that he thought was innovative and important, by aggregating others' websites in a very handy way, Matt Drudge proved in those early days that the internet would be to the 21st century what the proverbial street, car, street corner was to the 19th a place where the freedom of speech could be brought to life by anyone with an idea to share. I mean, that was a disruptive, permissionless innovation that the news business had never before seen. And it was, and I think still is, glorious. We don't have to rely on gatekeepers to tell us what information we should be allowed to hear and read. Now, if it was uncertain back then, I think it is certainly true today. The internet represents the complete democratization of speech. It allows me to speak to you and you to speak to me without anyone, a politician, a bureaucrat, a publisher, an anchor, an academic, anyone standing in the middle and telling us what will go through and what won't. And this seems to me to be unprecedented in our history. But again, that freedom isn't guaranteed. Now remember, as I said earlier, culture ultimately trumps law. And a society that doesn't believe in the freedom of speech will, over time, become complacent about it, if not hostile to it. And many of these, uh, many are already seeing threats to Americans' digital freedom of expression. Uh, recently, we have seen and heard about cases in which social media platforms have penalized or shut out altogether speakers with unpopular views. On Twitter, for instance, uh, something that I've used from my earliest days at the FCC, at Ajit Pai FCC, if you're curious, uh, many have voiced concern uh, that about speakers whose identity is no longer verified, which is a useful indicator of credibility. Others have voiced alarm about speakers who have been thrown off the platform altogether. Now, curiously, these cases often seem to arise uh, when the speaker is somebody who probably would feel comfortable at this conference. These are unfortunate developments for those of us who believe in the Internet's power to preserve and extend the freedom of speech. And I say that not to suggest that the government has some role here. I mean, obviously, private actors have the freedom to run their businesses the way they see fit. And neither the FCC nor any government agency, frankly, should dictate how it operates. And I say that not to suggest that I necessarily agree with what any of these given speakers has to say. But no, I say it because the internet is the new digital marketplace of ideas. It's a place where people can express themselves in a way that they never could have before. It's a place where people can be exposed to arguments they never would have seen before. It's a place where buyers and sellers, to carry that analogy forward, uh, can meet, can negotiate, can argue, can walk away, or can strike a deal. 
all as they see fit. And in my view, the internet is at its best when there are no unaccountable gatekeepers, public or private, who decide which ideas are appropriate and which should be banished from the bazaar. We cannot let the freedom of speech in the digital age depend on the approval of a select few. And that means that we have to speak up. Conservatives and, frankly, liberals have to speak up for this freedom. We have to fight for the First Amendment and the culture that is necessary to support it. We have to persuade the young, uh, who will one day be responsible for carrying the torch forward, for making sure that freedom of speech is preserved. For you Think about what will happen if we don't. I think Ronald Reagan was prescient when he said in 1961, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they could inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. And if you and I don't do this, then you and I may well spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in America when men were free. For my part, so long as I have the privilege of serving at the Federal Communications Commission, and so long as I have the privilege of being a citizen of this great country, I intend to spend my time fighting for that freedom, because without it, we are nothing more than the cold words of par on parchment. Thanks very much, and I turn it over to my colleague, uh, Ryan, for a different uh, attack on this issue, which is so critical. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, that is actually an excellent way I think we can start framing what it is we're actually talking about here. Uh, thank you also to the organizers of CPAC for putting all of this together. Um, my name is Ryan Hageman. I am the Department Head for Technology and Civil Liberties at the Niskanen Center. Uh, we are a nonprofit libertarian issue advocacy firm that focuses on engaging more with policymakers as a way of pushing forward best proposals for policy in various issue spaces. Uh, my focus largely revolves around robotics and automation, the economics thereof, as well as internet policy and internet governance issues. But another issue that I focus on very heavily is privacy and surveillance, especially as it relates to government surveillance. So I am going to tackle this issue from a slightly different angle than the commissioner has approached it from. I want to focus very much on the chilling effect that ubiquitous Orwellian-style government surveillance is having on our society and how it is going to continue uh, to uh, have deleterious effects on free speech moving forward. Jeremy Bentham was an 18th century English philosopher, mostly known for being the father of utilitarianism. But he's also famous for uh, architectural design of one particular uh, building, which he referred to as the Panopticon, and maybe some of you are familiar with it. The idea of the Panopticon is a prison structure. It is circular, all of the cells face a central uh, uh, platform upon which none of the prisoners can see through the glass of the windows. And the idea that Bentham was trying to get out with this structural design uh, was that when people merely believe, when they simply have an inkling that they may potentially be under surveillance, they behave in a far more conformist and a far more compliant manner. Now, Maybe this is the appropriate way to structure prisons. I don't take a position on that. However, Bentham went beyond applying this system of architectural social control simply to prisons and suggested that it could also be used in hospitals. It could be used in schools. It could be used in manufacturing plants. The idea here is that the panopticon is the ultimate architecture of social control and invariably leads to obedient, submissive, stagnant societies of non-individuals. It makes it too costly for individuals to actually assert their individual individuality and speak as they otherwise would speak <clears throat> freely. In short, it produces a less free society. Now, over the last 15 years, this country's surveillance state has exploded, both in terms of its scope and reach and in terms of the technological abilities available to intelligence agencies like the NSA. Um, the same uh, declining costs in processing and computer power that make all of us able to afford these marvelous supercomputers that we refer to as cell phones uh, 
that same declining cost also applies to surveillance technology. So even as we essentially become uh, more free, more capable of interacting with one another through global communications platforms, it also empowers more the surveillance state to actually look at what we're doing. And I often hear the expression that if you have nothing to hide, then you have nothing to fear. Uh, but let's think about that for a second. Is that actually the case? Uh, Cardinal Richelieu was uh, the uh, French spy master in the 17th century. He famously quipped uh, that uh, if you show me six lines written by the most honest man in the world, uh, I will find enough therein to hang him. Or if 17th century French autocrats aren't exactly your cup of tea, then let's move it to the 20th century, where Lavreni, Lavreni Berea, I'm sorry, I'm not a, a Russian scholar of language, Lavreni Berea, Stalin's own spy master and chief of his special police, put it far more succinctly. You show me a man, I'll show you the crime. I think many of the people in this room and many people who coalesce around conservative and libertarian uh, ideological propensities understand that the problem with constructing an omnipotent surveillance state, an omnipresent state that can surveil us wherever we are, whatever we're doing, and wherever we're going, maybe you trust the administration that sets that up. Maybe the George W. Bush administration, you were fond enough of to entrust them with that type of power. But we live in a democratic society, and there's no guarantee that the next administration will treat all of you and me favorably under that type of system. Uh, so th the key here um, is that in a society that is meant to be free and open in a society where we are supposed to value uh, competing ideas, where we're supposed to value the idea that maybe we don't have all the answers and maybe those with whom we disagree with vociferously can actually shed some light on where we can agree on the margins and allow us to arrive at new ideas of ways of doing things, new ways of, of being in this digital age. When you try to silence uh, opposition, um, what you get is that stagnant society that, that the panoptic is structured to produce. And so I think all of us in this room should be terribly concerned about the ever-expanding powers of state surveillance. And what troubles me the most working in DC in the job that I work and with the people I work is that I don't see a whole lot of conservatives or libertarians caring too much about this issue. Unfortunately, I have to admit that most of the people with whom uh, I deal with this issue on are left of center liberals and progressives. And I am not one myself, of course. However, their concerns are my concerns. In under this system that we have tacitly approved of creating, it's not just uh, left liberal progressives who are under surveillance, it's not just journalists and whistleblowers and people with whom some of us may have uh, fundamental ideological disagreements, it's also conservatives, it's Tea Partiers. We saw this with the IRS scandal under Lois Lerner. Now I'm not saying that the surveillance state played a part in that, I'm also not going to say it didn't, I'll leave that to your judgment, uh, but that case right there I think shows just how much of a bipartisan issue this is. It's not just our, our uh, ideological opponents who are under surveillance, it's us. We are also under surveillance. The surveillance state has essentially taken on a life of its own, and the only way that we're going to move back to a society where we're far more respectful of individual rights and of uh, of privacy, of uh, lending, into, and lending people uh, the, um, the, the rights that they are due to actually go about their lives and to be quote unquote left alone as a great Supreme Court justice once described privacy as. The only way we're going to move back towards a society like that is actually working with those who are also subjected to the same onerous surveillance of the intelligence community as we are. And I, I think I think what often goes undiscussed in this debate is the chilling effect that the surveillance state actually has on us. And I gave you the quote from Cardinal Richelieu, I gave you the quote uh, from Berea. Um, the key takeaway here, I think, is that we cannot trust the intelligence community or our government to be effective and uh, 
rights-respecting stewards uh, of our rights at all times. And this is not a phenomenon that is unique to the modern digital age. Uh, the abuses of the intelligence community, whether on their own or at the behest of that political power which is currently uh, uh, at the helm of the state's ship, goes back since the beginning of our republic. Uh, you go back to Nixon and Watergate and the abuses of the FBI and the NSA under him. Go back to the days of the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover and his attempts to essentially curtail the civil rights movement by surveilling people like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Go back to the Woodrow Wilson presidency, the Palmer raids of the 1920s, the American Protective League. Go back even further back from the Red Scare to the very beginnings of our nation. The first U.S. Postmaster General, Gideon Granger, was the J. Edgar Hoover of his time. In fact, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams explicitly uh, use cipher protocols, encryption in their communications, because they were concerned that Granger was going to get at the state secrets they were sharing with one another and use it to blackmail government officials. This is in the first two decades of the foundation of our republic. We always have to be on guard against the excesses, not just of government spending, not just of government writ large, but of the intelligence community, which naturally does need to exist in order to protect us. But we have to ask ourselves, what are we willing to trade for an illusory sense of security? Because remember, perfection is not for this world. We will never be 100% secure. And so we have to ask ourselves, what kind of a society do we, wish to, do we wish to live in? Do we wish to live in the panopticon? Do we wish to live under the constant threat and fear of surveillance that chills our speech and sets us all to be far more conformist, sets us all to essentially uh, live as we would live under a totalitarian dictatorship like we've seen the... Uh, like we've seen in the, the past uh, hundred years? Or would we rather embrace the freedom of speech? Would we rather embrace the freedom to discourse, uh, to uh, 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 discuss with one another openly uh, in the public forum? And so I think it behooves all of us um, to ask ourselves whether or not that is the type of society we want or if we would rather live in the cage of the panopticon. Thank you. Uh, so those, I suppose, are the uh, opening remarks that we have. Um, but given that this is an event on free speech, we would like to open up questions to the audience and basically have a conversation with you. What are you thinking? What do you disagree with us about? And what do you agree with us about? And what questions might you have? And this can be either for myself or the commissioner. Uh, yes, sir. For the commissioner, first, you sure. mentioned social media like Facebook and Twitter. I've had experience with Facebook censoring posts that I put on conservative groups defending black conservatives, things like that. There's nothing wrong with those posts. There's no pornography. But they suspend my account. I don't know whether it's Facebook employees or whether it's trolls going through and marking it as spam or something. To what extent do you think the federal government could enable free speech by forbidding Facebook policy or forcing Facebook to change its policy to allow full free speech for both sides? It's a good question, uh, and I've heard this uh, from a lot of people who have posted things on Facebook that seem to go away from the ether or are you know, pushed down in the, the search results. You don't see it on your friend's timeline, for example, as prominently as you might see other similar messages on the other side. Uh, the bad news is that, you know, from your perspective, is that the federal government doesn't really have a role to play here. We don't, we don't and we cannot uh, tell Facebook or any other social media platform, uh, you can't have to adopt these kinds of protocols and allow these kinds of posts uh, to proliferate on people's timelines. What we can do, however, is talk about the importance of having a truly free and open internet. And that means not just the networks over which these uh, you know, packets of information that tra are transmitted, but also the platforms themselves have to be a genuine marketplace of ideas. That's, that's I think, what makes Facebook and other social media platforms great, is that you can connect with people and express yourself, and they can hear your views and disagree with you uh, if they see fit. Um, so I, it's more of a bully pulpit function, you may be able to embarrass them, for example, by being outspoken about that kind of behavior. And the further reason why I brought up, for example, the, the case of Twitter, because I think Twitter is such a, for me at least, has been such a fantastic platform, and I would not want to see a world in which, uh, as I said, an uncountable few decide which people are allowed to tweet which messages and which aren't. And uh, that's, uh, I think they're just compromising the entire value of the platform if it was uh, sort of a wall to earn, so to speak. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> Whoopsies. Yeah. <laughs>
Uh, yes. Um, this is what you were talking about. Uh, of all the candidates on either side of the party, Senator Paul seems to be the only one directly concerned and had set plans to deal with this intelligence agency that you, that you were talking about. So do you kind of support like the way he goes about it, or like what candidate did you see out of anyone that directly talked about and had the best solution for things such as NSA spy? This is quite the election season, is it not? I'm reminded of the quote from uh, the English philosopher Desiderius Erasmus, in the land of the blind, it would seem the one-eyed man is king. Um, I am a fan of Senator Paul. Uh, I supported him long ago. Um, and while I love his sentiment in railing against the surveillance state, I have not yet seen an actual politically viable proposal to move us further away from this Orwellian surveillance state that we find ourselves standing upon the precipice of. And I wish that Senator Paul would actually come up with that proposal because it's something that I could back in its entirety. Um, last spring, the uh, Congress and Senate and uh, President Obama signed into law the USA Freedom Act. Now, there are many things not ideal about that act. However, my organization did support it because it moved us incrementally closer to tearing down the most onerous portions of the surveillance state that have been erected in the post 9-11 era. There is not going to be a bill that will ever pass the Senate, in my opinion, or the Congress in general, um, that will be the get rid of the panopticon bill. It just won't happen. Uh, the trouble that we are now running into, uh, we have only just been made aware of the extent of the abuse of, of, of uh, the NSA and other intelligence agencies since the revelations of Edward Snowden, which was only about, just about three years ago, um, plus or minus a few months. Um, in that time, the surveillance state, when I say it's growing, I don't mean this abstract concept or this abstract principle of we must surveil everyone in order to keep our nation secure has grown. I mean the actual physical infrastructure, the build out of uh, new agencies and new employees to take up the helm of this state have grown. You have institutional lock-in right now. You have tens of thousands of jobs that rely on the surveillance state. You have industries that are wholly reliant on selling surveillance software and hardware to not just, uh, not just um, spy agencies here in this country, but agencies across the world. This is not the type of thing that will simply disappear overnight. And so what we need to do is start to find common ground with those who take the hard line hawkish position that the surveillance state is good, it keeps <coughs> Americans secure, and we need to keep growing it or at least maintain uh, where it is at right now. Um, so I, I, in short, I, I love Senator Paul. I love the sentiment. But I have not seen a politically viable path forward in actually moving towards more incremental reform. Yes? Uh, the, uh, the fundamental question here, I believe, is uh, the encryption question, whether or not it is appropriate for law enforcement or the intelligence community uh, to mandate uh, the creation of a security vulnerability in a hardware or software device in order to allow them easy access to the device. Uh, my organization and I personally am avowedly against that. And most of the reason for that, you know, put, let's put aside for a second civil rights. Let's put aside for a second the human rights uh, implications for this globally. Let's look at the economic ramifications of this. Every single time you engage in e-commerce online, every single time you use an ATM, every single time you go to Target or some other store and you swipe your credit card or your debit card, your financial information is protected by strong encryption. So my major concern here more than anything else is that the digital economy that is the primary driver of economic growth in the modern age uh, is essentially reliant on this, this trust-based ecosystem that encryption engenders. So the installation of mandatory backdoors into these types of devices, into software protocols like HTTP, Secure, um, that is absolutely 100% a non-starter for me, for every single major uh, world-renowned technologist, and I think for anyone who has actually done a deep dive into this issue. So no encryption, or no, no uh, yes encryption, no backdoors.
So I'm informed that is uh, unfortunately all the time we have, but I want to thank uh, CPAC and uh, Dan Schneider, the, uh, the able leader of uh, the organization, for inviting us. Thanks to all of you for coming. If you have any other further questions or thoughts, feel free to get in touch with us afterward or follow us on Twitter. We'd be more than happy to answer your, uh, your questions about free speech in the digital age. Thank you. But don't leave. Oh. Oh, you can applaud. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this has been about life, liberty, and property. That's what this is really all about. When we talk about free speech in the digital age, if you have a property interest, and I know this sounds a little convoluted, but this is the centerpiece of our democracy and our freedom. And I want to encourage you to stay here because we have the world's greatest po political, historical philosopher on our founding. Professor Daniel Robinson um, uh, is a professor in, at Oxford, not 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 uh, not Cambridge in Massachusetts, but uh, you know Oxford University, and uh, he is going to talk about this very fundamental notion of property and who we are as a people based on our founders' concept of prop property. This is going to be the most interesting thing of all of CPAC. Yeah, so. Other than our panel, that is. But. You're you're number two. <laughs> number two is not bad. Silver medal in the gold, uh, silver medal in the Olympics. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But, but it, thank you guys for coming so much. But please, please stay for Daniel Robinson, Professor Robinson. Please. Oh, good. Good job. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah, it's great. That's, that's quite an.